Doctors with disabilities exist in small but measurable numbers. How did they navigate their journey? What were the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? What can we learn from their experiences? My name is Lisa Meeks, and I'm thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Join me as I interview docs, nurses, psychologists, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and the list goes on. I'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that ensure medicine remains an equal opportunity profession. Hello and welcome back to the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Today we are joined by the Chief Resident of the UT Austin Pediatrics Program, Dr. Yuen Trong, and UT Austin's Pediatric Residency Program Director, Dr. Nolinda Transangave. In this episode, Dr. Meeks, Dr. Trong, and Dr. Transangave discuss the accommodation system from multiple perspectives, the importance of team-wide support to ensure access for doctors with disabilities, and the value disabled doctors bring to healthcare. We begin with an introduction by Dr. Trong and Dr. Transangave. Chief Resident at UT Austin Dell Medical School Pediatric Residency Program. My name is Nalinda Charnsangave. I am a pediatrician and I am the Pediatric Residency Program Director in Austin, Texas. Thank you so much to both of you for coming on the show. And it turned out it it's a really small world, right? We have some some people in common. And so I want to do a quick shout out to those people, certainly Chris Moreland, who is also at UT Dell, and then Michael Kim, who was your student affairs dean at Minnesota. What a small world and a, and a small world of really good people dedicated to disability inclusion. So that's exciting. But why don't you tell us about your background and your, your experience coming to medicine? Well, I'm glad to be here today, and kind of to tell my story. I was born and raised up in Minnesota in a Vietnamese family. I was born and diagnosed with a genetic condition called osteopetrosis. I had it, and my brother also had it as well, but he had a more severe form. This disease causes your bones to be brittle. And so when I was young, I actually could walk, do a lot of things where I actually didn't know I was disabled, other than maybe I was walking a little weird, but somehow I think I was raised in a way where I didn't really recognize it, and I just did what I wanted to do. When I was in middle school, my bones became brittle enough and I grew big enough where they couldn't quite support me. And that's when I started using a wheelchair full time. And I used a power wheelchair, which my first one, interestingly, was donated by a family friend to me to use. And that's kind of where my journey started in my like, disability, learning about all the resources out there, learning how to navigate the world with assistive devices and, and all the accommodations and, that come with it. And so once we kind of got in touch with this family who helped my mom, my parents learn about this world, we got my, me a brand new chair that was more fitted for me. My parents now try to help whoever they come in contact with. In school, I was always, I think I always usually got either achiever or compassionate person. And so I always wanted to get straight A's. I was actually valedictorian in high school or one of the six in high school. My parents always had that kind of standard for me. I never thought that, oh, I have a disability. Like, like it's okay if you don't get good grades. It's okay if you don't study. Like, they were like, yes, you should study. Take the AP cl classes, whatever you like. And they supported me through all my endeavors. 
And so I went to college. I went to the University of Minnesota. I always knew I was interested in science. I always was one to participate in science fairs, kind of that competitive nature in me, wanting to do a project, wanting to excel. And I took that into my college years. But also, I realized during my engineering studies that I wasn't a great engineer. That's a good one. But I just didn't love the field. I didn't love being kind of the lone soldier in doing research. I was more of a people person and wanting to help people kind of see it through and care for people. In our next segment, Dr. Trong describes her path to medical school and residency, her concerns about her disability and how it would affect her prospects, the ease of receiving accommodations, and how a supportive program director made a world of difference. I was always interested in medicine. It was always a question of, could I do it? And I think Minnesota was a great place where I would go to career fairs. I would ask the people of the medical school whether I would be able to do it. One person came up to me one day at a career fair and was like, here, I'll send you the requirements, the technical requirements, which have like the physical requirements. And it never really said things that where I, I was like, oh, I this definitely means I can't do it. And they were encouraging me to do it. And there were programs at my college too. There was this one program called Minnesota Future Doctors that I joined in college. And they were a program that helped pre-meds from underrepresented backgrounds get into medical school. So I credit this program a lot with helping me find opportunities in research and leadership and help guide me through applying to medical school. I only applied to three medical schools because I knew my limitation in living in a different place. I didn't have that luxury or moving to like California or any state to go to medical school. I knew I really only could stay in Minnesota or I have family in Texas. So I apply to both of those areas and I actually only got one interview and it was really, this is probably what, almost a decade ago. So I only interviewed in Minnesota and at the time, again, overachiever me, I was like, well, I have to have plan B because I always need to know what I'm doing. And so I was in the process of, as my plan B, applying to pharmacy school as well as my backup plan, knowing that I wanted to be in healthcare. And the, the week that I was going to submit my pharmacy application, I got accepted into medical school. I went through medical school. I got connected with the Disability Resource Center. I think Barb, who we share acquaintance with, is the graduate advocate. And we got connected and we talked about like, what is required through medical school? What would I need accommodations for? What I can achieve on my own? That's where we started our journey, I think. It was went really smoothly, and I felt like there is ways where I think my medical school was like, this hospital would be a better fit for me to do this rotation at, which helped a lot. So that's a couple of things that we thought of ahead. And then I applied to residency, and I think when I applied to residency, I always knew I wanted to do peds, and I, I think... We had some concerns. I know I had some letter writers who were like, maybe you should think about like a backup. And then I had other letter writers who was like, yes, I would be happy to have her as a colleague. And I geared towards those because those make the strongest application. 
And I think when I started applying for residency, I was like, I think I need to spread my wings and I need to apply broadly and get and try something else because I grew up in Minnesota. I went to undergrad in, at the university. I went to medical school at the university. And I wanted to see if I could learn a different system, see a new location and that's how I ended up in Austin because when I interviewed there, I was like, this is, this is kind of like the happy medium. I have family here, but it's a new state, a new city, a city that felt like it matched me. And I ranked it as my number one. I was very happy when I opened that letter that day. The disability accommodation process can be daunting for both trainees and administrators. Let's hear from Dr. Trung and Dr. Transengave about how working together and establishing mutual trust enhanced the training experience. I'm going to switch back to you, Nalinda. From my perspective, kind of watching this unfold from afar and having talked to the program when you first matched, I feel like there was just a commitment there. And I'm wondering what fed that commitment. Do you have experience with disabilities or were you around people with disabilities? What was the thought when you did this interview? And were there any concerns or questions? So as a program director, I have had some experience working with individuals who have had disabilities, but not, not a lot. I had probably worked with two to three trainees at that point who had requested accommodations through our formal processes. And this was going to be something that I had not formally or thought about with as much intentionality as I had previously done before. In fact, many of the other trainees that I had worked with who had disabilities had more non-apparent disabilities that were really disclosed and not discussed very much in the interview process. I remember interviewing Wien very distinctly. One thing about Wien is, is that she is an incredibly authentic person who really tries to put people at ease. And she, on her interview day, when I asked her, why would you consider coming to Texas? Her response was, well, her wheelchair doesn't cooperate with the snow that much. So it was time for a change. So really a lot of the thought about whether or not we could do this and how we could do this started actually before the interview day, because we was very proactive. She had made arrangements and had asked about accessibility in our spaces and whether or not she would use a rental wheelchair or another type of wheelchair. And so we were already aware of that before she came to interview, but it really made us as a program think about, again, being intentional, making sure that we were accessible. We had a physician who works in our comprehensive care clinic, which is a medical home for patients who have multiple chronic illnesses and are often technology dependent. This pediatrician happened to be one of Wan's interviewers. And I don't know if she remembers that, but it was certainly, I think, something that really had us all kind of thinking. And I actually had a discussion with this physician who talked about how impactful that would be for his patients for patients in that clinic. And we really thought about the benefits of training a pediatrician like we in for our patients. 
you asked me a question about sort of my experience in working with individuals with disabilities. And I mentioned I had trainees, a handful, under a handful of trainees who had disclosed disabilities. But as a pediatrician, I do work with patients who have disabilities. And it was really at that point when we were talking about how important that could be, or again, and how impactful that would be. And as we're looking at this four years later, and Leanne is about to start her career as a complex care pediatrician, it is certainly something to be really excited about. I would love to send that pediatrician a thank you note, a personal thank you note, because I think Wow. Most people don't see the connection with kind of health outcomes and and feelings of belonging and, and what that does for a patient to see a physician with a disability taking care of them, right? Without ever communicating verbally the message a child receives when they see a disabled physician, especially if it's a disability that parallels their disability. I can't imagine what that must be like for those children. I know that our listeners will be thinking, well, you know, that's all well and good. And that's such a great heartwarming story. Wonderful, wonderful. But you have to be able to do X, Y, and Z, and you have to be able to pass the boards and you have to be able to do all these things. This makes sense. But how do we actually operationalize that in the setting? And I know you were a champion beyond champion, being proactive and understanding what the procedures would be, being proactive and understanding what the accommodations process would be, and making sure that as the program director, you were authentically communicating the milestones that we would meet, making sure that you're graduating a highly competent pediatrician. And so many people, I think, make assumptions. I know they make assumptions about how difficult it's going to be or about what, what the person won't be able to do. And they don't stop and do what you did, Nalinda, which was to say, well, I actually don't know. I'm not going to let all of the stereotype take over and make decisions, I'm going to actually run a list and and stay grounded in facts. Can you talk to the audience a little bit more about what you did in the process that you went through? As we were working through the process of trying to figure out how are we going to implement accommodations, how are we going to make sure that we can meet the requirements of a pediatrician. I'm going to share that I, coming into this again, was not at all what I would consider an expert. I was a program director who was trying to approach this from the standpoint of what makes a pediatrician. I had not really given much thought to what technical standards were. And that was my first start, was how do we define what a pediatrician is? What makes someone a pediatrician? What makes someone a a resident? What do we actually think is essential? And in what ways can we meet these goals and help women meet these goals and standards? A lot of the work also involved seeking advice from people who do this and have the knowledge. And there are people who are out there who have dedicated their careers to figuring out how to advise programs and and trainees. And so I remember reaching out to Lisa. I remember reaching out to the American Board of Pediatrics and the ACGME to have discussions and to ask questions about exactly what they meant by certain things. One area that potentially came up as a potential challenge or something that we needed to address um, was very early on in training. And that included how to complete certain procedures and how to get WAN certified in doing CPR and resuscitation of sick kids. And 
she had actually already done this training that we were thinking about trying to figure out how to get this done, but she'd actually completed CPR training at her medical school. But part of our discussion and questions that we asked with the American Board of Pediatrics and the ACGME were about how to find these accommodations for completing CPR. And they were helpful in that they said, the ABP said, we actually do not require you as a program director to sign people off on procedural competency. There's not a requirement to look at procedures. You as a program director are supposed to assess the general competency of a physician and determine with assistance from clinical competency committees and other groups, the overall competency of a physician. They talked about accommodations being not having to perform the procedures themselves, but also if there is the ability to direct a procedure, to discuss the indications and direct somebody to complete a procedure as a very reasonable accommodation. Can you repeat that again? Because I really think people have no idea. And this is in residency training. We're not talking about medical school. So if it's applicable to residency training, certainly it's something we can look at in medical training and and UME. But can you just say it one more time for our audience? Sure. I have the support of these institutions, these organizations that are our accrediting bodies to say that they are supportive of individuals with disabilities. They also said that as a program director, I was not required to comment specifically on procedural competency for the American Board of Pediatrics. They have no questions about procedural competency in their verification of competency. There is not a specific requirement to log procedures, et cetera, from the American Board of Pediatrics. What I am supposed to assess is a trainee's overall competency skills and knowledge and their fitness to be a pediatrician. And I can use the resources that I have available, including my clinical competency committee and evaluations to make that assessment. They also said a potential reasonable accommodation would be to complete procedures. A reasonable accommodation could be the physician identifying the indications for a procedure, how to do, describing how to do a procedure, the common complications of a procedure, and they could guide somebody through the act of completing a procedure. And that being said, we did all of this work and Wien is also very capable of doing the procedures herself in the right appropriate setting. And so I also want to say, you can do all of this work. You can ask about all of these things. And it wasn't necessary in this case, but it was really great to know that the American Board of Pediatrics did not have these requirements specifically. And there were ways to interpret it. You bring up this great point about, it's good to have this information, and yet we shouldn't assume what someone can and cannot do just because they're a wheelchair user, right? There are various types of individuals who utilize wheelchairs and some have more or less hand functioning. Some have more or less core control and we should not be placing limitations on people or waiving something that's critical. In this case, there was no procedural requirement, but as you said, Wien was more than capable of doing these things and caring for patients independently. Wien, what was 
what was it like for you when we left you, you've opened the envelope, you're thrilled, you're beyond thrilled, you're moving to Texas. And did you have any fears about being able to meet these requirements or milestones? What were your concerns? I think it was probably a Friday when I opened my envelope. And then the next week, I think I reached out to Dr. G and Mary, the program coordinator at that time, pretty early, like within the next week, being like, can we start planning for me coming in two months now that I match? And here are what I, the combinations I have in medical school. And I connected Barb with them so that if there was any additional questions that I may not be able to answer, she may have like a document or a form or what about how I would do certain requirements and things like that. And so we started that conversation really early. And this is what I tell anyone who comes to me with questions about this. I know, I know I've talked to a few pre-med or medical students who are applying to residency and what to do after. So starting early and planning again, because I would like to know what to quell my anxiety and worry, I want to start planning. I'm a big planner, which is probably why I'm in this chief resident role too. Um, And so I emailed them, we started talking, and I think at of that time, the biggest things we talked about were access, things about around the hospital. A lot of things are thought of when you do your first talk with HR and things like that, because they are a little bit some of the drivers of what you need for your job. And so I had to go through that and really just touring the hospital, being like, okay, this is the workspace. I can't quite get into here. Am I able to access the doors? And thought thought process behind those things. I think the technical requirements part, I honestly didn't really think about as much as I did through medical school. I think because in medical school, I was able to have these experiences already and watch and observations and learning about all these things I was like oh okay I think I can do that or I know how I will need assistance with this versus when I applied to medical school and not knowing these technical requirements I now knew how to navigate it a bit more and I think as I go through this whole kind of process I learn more and more and kind of bring that skill to my next job next step in the journey and being more prepared to be like, here is what I come with. This is what I know I need. But a lot of times when you are first starting, you're really learning what things you can and what things you may need a little bit of help with. There is a lot to be said about the importance of having a supportive team during medical training. Let's hear from our guests about how this kind of environment was cultivated at UT Austin. Nalinda, you you use the word authentic and authenticity is something that I think we could use a little bit more of in medicine. I, I feel like I meet so many people who are going down their path of medical training with so much armor because let's face it I mean for certain populations it's just not safe to be authentically yourself in medicine there's lots of harm there's lots of bias there's lots of stigma but when I talk to program directors and residents who have had a ton of success it it really does tend to boil down to trust. And part of that trust is the ability to be authentic, to to communicate with one another. Can you speak to how this authenticity played a role in easing 
the transition and easing the process. Absolutely. I think that thankfully, Wynne felt comfortable enough to be her authentic self with us. And like I said, from the start, she was very open about talking about her wheelchair and being a wheelchair user. If I look back on the experience from four years ago, we were thrilled on match day. We were so excited. We we also needed that email from her the following week saying, hey, can we find some time to start talking about accommodations and how to make sure that the spaces are accessible? And the fact that she reached out allowed us to ask for help, ask for assistance and guidance from people who are experts. And honestly, that was a huge relief for me. I was going to ask you if that was a relief because you can only do so much as the program director. You can't make assumptions. You cannot, you know, reach out and say, well, we, we know you're going to need things. So we need to talk. I bet it was a relief. Kind of, it, it took the wall down and you could start the conversation. It was absolutely a relief because yes, I think, again, I said, we were so thrilled and excited that she had matched with us. But as we were thinking through, how do we make our program more accessible, more inclusive? Uh, it was so important that she could reach out and say, hey, we like, can we start talking about this? She also gave us permission to, to speak to Barb that everyone has mentioned and this wonderful wealth of knowledge and being able to have an expert who could share with us what was implemented and what worked in medical school was an incredibly valuable resource. And I think that moved up and accelerated our ability to implement the accommodations and make the changes to our spaces that we needed. It really just, it really helped us to be able to do everything on time as possible. A couple of months from getting into matching into a program and starting is a really fast turnaround. And I think that the fact that Leanne was so open and knowledgeable was critical to us being able to do this somewhat successfully. And Leanne, you could have come into the situation being very quiet and not communicating your needs or trying to pretend like you don't have any needs. But I wonder how your experience at Minnesota, how your experience with such a knowledgeable disability resource professional like Barb Blacklock and with such a kind of champion support in student affairs like Michael Kim, how that actually empowered you to take control of the situation or did it? Or is that just part of your personality? You mentioned you're a planner. Well, I think it's a combination for sure. I call myself an introvert extrovert. So I can be extroverted if things call for it, but inherently I am an introvert. So I definitely can see points in my life where I'm like, I don't want to be a bother. I think that's a big thing that comes up, not wanting to be a bother to wherever they're doing because you are a wheelchair user, not wanting to have someone go out of their way to help you do a certain thing. And so I think I definitely have that quality within me, but to get where I am I think and to have to have seen that if I just if I ask it doesn't hurt and the worst you could get is 
no, that that might not work, or maybe it'll open the conversation with me. Okay, that may not work for us, but maybe this we could do this and uh, starting that conversation. I think definitely having people around me who like the disability resources resource center who was knowledgeable in a lot of these things and knew how to navigate these conversations a lot and having a lot of these meetings with Barb being like, okay, so what should I do next? And how should I navigate this conversation? Empowered me to be, to be like, okay, I, I need to start asking. I need to plan ahead. And then I think that's another aspect that went into me reaching out sooner than later. I admit it was harder said than done. And I definitely had at least two people read this email before I sent it out <laughs> being like, Hi, thank you for matching me. Can we start a conversation about this? And then waiting to have this conversation and making preparing lists on being like, what do I need to function in the hospital? What clinical sites are we at? What are all the spaces we need to evaluate? I think that all those kind of played into a role in planning how we kind of set up the conversation. In the next section, Dr. Meeks poses a question about how the program director can make or break an experience and to what end we need to adhere to best practice for trainee protections. It may be that the balance lies in the trust and good faith of the program. So I'm going to throw a curveball at both of you because I feel like if we if we were to rewrite the story, if we were to go back, if we had a time machine and we could go back, there's not much that would have improved it. But if you were to read my guidance, if you were to read best practice, if you were to read all the things not to do, one of those things would be to not have the program director be the person who gets contacted. But in this case, it worked out. One of the reasons that we say it shouldn't be the program director is because that puts so much responsibility and so much power in one person's lap and also sets up a situation where you may be privy to information that is more sensitive, highly sensitive. But you mentioned you had a few other students and and we know because we've done the research we know that even though we say don't do this about 25 percent of programs explicitly call for the program director to manage the disability stuff when it works out really well it is almost exclusively a situation where you have a program director who is committed to disability access and there's a connection between the program director and the resident coming in and People are honest, they feel trust in that space and everything gets worked out. You may not know all of the things, that's okay, but you have a commitment together to figure it out, right? In good faith. So how do we balance that? How do we balance this? Oh, you know, the the double AMC report says not to do this. Don't have the program director be this person. And yet we're sitting here on the podcast and I'm saying, gosh, you know, so many of these situations are go right when it is the program director who is committed to this. So how do we how do we balance that? And what what is the formal process at Dell? So I can certainly start and take that. I certainly wish that I wasn't learning how to navigate the process while doing the process. And so I also read all of the guidance of, oh, I probably shouldn't be doing that, or perhaps I shouldn't have asked this, or if I was reflecting and going back and looking at emails and seeing that, I breathe a sigh of relief that, okay, I didn't ask for these questions, or these things weren't coming directly to me, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think that part of the reason why it worked was obviously that there was a commitment from the residency program to make it work. I, Our formal process is actually for the trainee to undergo a health screen 
through our human resources. And that is when they connect with the institution and first meet the disability services provider. And so the way it turned out in this situation is that, again, Wan was having to travel a very far distance and there was certainly expectedly not a desire to come to Austin for a health screen in March when she was going to move in May or June. We knew there was going to be a delay in her having that assessment. And so we kind of needed to think through how can we do this without having that formal process in place. And that's kind of the best way for it to work. And so that's kind of how that all evolved. I don't know that I have a great solution, except that if you don't have a program director that is committed to working with your disability service providers, then you might encounter more challenges. There's so much on program directors. I do think they become you know, the parents, the psychologists, the attorney, like the, that PD hat has a lot of slices in it, right? There's a lot of different roles that you play. And I think we were all lucky to have set, to have we in coming from such a robust program with such knowledge and it did work out at the end of the day. So I struggle, I struggle with this. We end, I want your perspective. What could have been better? Would it have felt better to you to go to a neutral party or was part of the allure or part of the kind of safety and good vibes, if you will, because you were dealing directly with Melinda? I think definitely because I felt a connection with Dr. C and Mary and the program itself. And when I came to Austin, I was like, well, that felt right. And so because I had had that feeling, I felt comfortable enough to reach out. I never had to have HR and anything like that really kill residency. So learning that HR is the go-to person was a learning experience for me coming down here and starting this role as a resident. And so navigating that and really, I know I talked to Dr. She and Mary, the program coordinator at that time a lot about everything already, not knowing that the HR person is the one who's going to figure this out. And you're like, how much do I disclose to the HR person? If I disclose too much, would they tell me, no, you can't work in this job? was something that definitely did concern me at that time. I don't know why I, I didn't have any issue disclosing to Dr. C or the program itself because I already matched here. They they already knew, but like the HR person, I was like, hmm, if I come here and I say like, oh, I need this or I need that, would they be like, oh, maybe she can't work here. I remember the nurse who was the person in occupational health who did my health screening that day. And she was very open. She's like, what is an assistant? And I'm like, oh, this is what it is. She's like, okay, got it. And I remember she called me later to, because I think she had to run stuff by multiple people, I'm sure. And was like, you're clear now. And I was like, great. That part definitely did worry me a little bit because I didn't know that hurdle what I had to like go through because I've never had to do it before until starting this first real job. When it comes to accommodations, every person's needs are different. Let's hear how having an access assistant allowed Dr. Trung to flourish as a pediatrician. to me about the assistant. So many people have varied definitions of what an intermediary is and what they do and what they do not do. Oftentimes when you use the title assistant, it's it 
comes with a secondary word, which is access assistant. And that seems to be the formal kind of HR title. Talk to me about the the idea of this assistant and what the person actually did in the clinical setting. Well, during my medical school training, we called this position that we hired for an access assistant. I think here in residency, we, to have a job role within the hospital, we had them hired on as patient care tech. Um, but just my personal in patient care tech, per se. And their role is to help me as a provider navigate the hospital on my daily work day. I go into a patient room. The door is heavy and goes back on to you. So they will assist me in going into the patient room by opening the door for me. Or when I, this is a patient who needs isolation precautions. So they will help grab the isolation gear for me, which is either too low in the ground or too high up that I am unable to reach it. And they will help me down up if I need a little bit of assistance. And then we go into the room. A lot of rooms will have backpack shoes, tables around in the room. So they will help move these items out of the way so I am able to go up to my patient and communicate with them and to be able to examine them. And they will, again, reach for things that are out of my hand reach. Or in some ways, my chair does go up and down. So I'm able to access patients at various levels, whether that's in clinic or in the hospital. But to navigate sometimes to go around the bed or around the long way around certain things to reach certain items. So, and that takes time. And as we go in healthcare, things are very fast and you want to be efficient. So the access assistant in their role will help me in that they are able to grab things by taking the shorter path and passing them to me so that I don't have to take that extra two minutes to go the long way, grab it, and then go back. And then by the end of our whole exam, sometimes they will help me with exams because I do have a lifting restriction with my disorder. I will instruct them, and I instruct them on all things, meaning I will be like, can you help me lift this leg? And I will show them where I want their hands placed. And sometimes I will actually hold their hands within my hands so I can feel as well. But they provide kind of the muscle in certain things, but I instruct them the whole way. And then after the exam is done and we exit the room, they will put the room back to how it was before. And those are the big things that they help with day to day. And then the rest, I do all the clinical decision making. I do all the communication with parents and kind of all that part, the mental thinking part is all me. And they really are there to help me navigate my work day in a more efficient and timely way and help me be able to safely do my job as well. If we translate that to practice, it sounds like an MA. I I mean, essentially, people are always saying, well, what are you going to do when you go into practice? I'm like, it's essentially what an MA does. And, you know, sometimes we'll be talking about somebody who has a communication disorder or some, or something else. And they have a scribe. That's essentially what an MA does. Like the, all of these things that once you get through the hoops of training, they're actually in place in practice. What is the thing that the access assistant doesn't do, which I think is really important for our audience to understand. So I think Leanne did a great job of explaining what the access assistant does. 
she also mentioned, and you also mentioned that the role sounds like something that an MA does. And I just wanted to clarify that when we hired the access assistant, this type of position did not exist within our institution or our organization. And so we had to create a job description, but the position actually ended up being hired as a clinical assistant. So it was not necessarily a new role or category. So an access assistant does not do any medical decision-making or diagnosis. That is all directed by the physician, the trainee. And so they are really helping the trainee access the patient, assess the patient, but it's up to the trainee to be, or the physician to be responsible for the diagnosis, the medical decision-making, the interpretation of the exam findings, et cetera. And so you actually don't have to have a medical background per se, with the exception of, we certainly made sure that within the requirements, having comfort with being around people in clinical situations was necessary. Having physicians with disabilities brings a lot of value to any clinic. The ability to relate to and provide care for disabled populations is bolstered by one's own personal experiences. Listen in as Dr. Trong shares how her disability enhanced her clinical skills. William, talk to me about how parents and patients respond to you when they meet you. Yeah, I have gotten a lot of comments on how I have a calming presence. <laughs> there is a story this year that I walked into this room with a toddler. I think he was about two. And I walked in first and he looks at me in my chair. I think he gets probably the first time he sees a physician or a person, you know, in a wheelchair. And he's like, what's this? And <laughs> Just, that's why I love kids, because they're very blunt and they're very curious. And there's no judgment with that. He was just very curious. A lot of kids are curious about wheels and they think it's really cool. And that's all been always one of the exciting factors. I'm like, look at these wheels. And they'll like watch me and around as I wheel around the room. And so that's been really great. And I came into residency knowing I wanted to do work with kids with disabilities, work with kids with medical complexities. I think that comes from years of my personal experience, which I take a lot into my practice. Being a patient, being hospitalized frequently, and going to a lot of doctor's appointments, I understand where, where a lot of them are coming from and how hard it is, and just being there listening to them and relating to them, I think brings on a new level with parents and our relationship and bond and their trust in here. The other thing that I hear a lot from programs is, well, how are parents going to respond or how are patients going to respond or patients aren't going to want to be treated by a physician with a disability. And it's, it's difficult for me to, to communicate how wrong they are, how calming having a physician with a disability is, how reassuring it is to know that that person has gone through being a patient before is to to people. And I I do think that programs tend to be very short-sighted with that. They don't really understand, you know, the impact that this can have and how it also normalizes having a disability, especially with children. 
And Melinda, did you ever have any concerns or any parents that were concerned about their children being you know, under the care of Wien? I have never heard concerns from families or parents of children. In fact, I've only received notes of praise and thanks for having Wien care for their children. I think one of the hardest things was actually that most of the questions or concerns that were raised about Wien's capacity to complete residency or to be a pediatrician came internally. A lot of it came from people who had not ever met her, had not ever reviewed her application, had not ever, probably had not ever worked with a trainee with a disability that they knew of before. I will admit that the period from match day until she arrived was actually fairly stressful because I was getting a lot of questions and people were asking me about, well, how are you going to do this? And can you do this? What if this happens? And part of me was like, I don't know. Why don't you ask her when, <laughs> when she comes? I love that response, by the way. <laughs> and and I and I I want to say all of that fear. I want to normalize it because I do I don't want to demonize people. I think that that is a pretty normative reaction, but again, it's coming from a medical model of impaired, not impaired, disabled, not disabled and the misperceptions we have around that and then the overall kind of culture of ableism that we all live in that breeds this misunderstanding about ability. And so I I love your response. Why don't you ask her? And that is the ultimately the most respectful and responsible thing to do, right? And then if the trainee doesn't know because they haven't been a pediatric resident before, to say, well, let's figure it out together. Once she arrived, there was almost this calm when she comes into the room. It, there is something calming. And I think for people, it was really just the unknown and the lack of experience. And once they got to meet her and she was very straightforward about things, it allowed people to, okay, step back and think, okay, well, how have you done this in the past? And it made things go a lot better because she was actually here. It was this concept or this idea that I think stressed people out quite a bit and had me stressed really as well. And at the end of the day, I think it's pretty incredible that you are now going back to Minnesota to be a physician in the complex care clinic that, where you received care as a patient. I mean, if that is not full circle, I don't know what is. It just seems, it seems like kismet. The reason I came down here is because I wanted to escape the snow, at least for a couple of years. My wheelchair really doesn't do well in snow. And now four years down here, and I haven't changed my ball bearings in my chair like once. But I've always said, if I go back, it will be for this clinic, this clinic that definitely took care of me like I could do whatever I wanted. And they didn't see me as someone who had a disability. They saw me as someone who, well, you have a limitation here. Let's do all these things to help you thrive out in the world and do whatever you want to do. So that those doctors were ones I looked up to and definitely contributed to my interest in medicine and my interest in wanting to work there in the future. I think they saw your skills as an asset. It's really exciting to have this kind of come full circle. And then you're writing up a case study. So not only is it coming full circle, but you're paying it forward. I, I know there are schools 
today who are not accepting students because they are wheelchair users and because they're fearful. I know that there are wheelchair users who are accepted to medical school and they're not being fully engaged in the curriculum because people don't know what to do and they're not reaching out and asking for help. I know there are people not matching because people are afraid and they have the, all these preconceived notions. So your contribution to the literature will be the first that I know of in GME and so that is exciting for me because, yes, we have a couple of case studies that have come out in UME, but everyone will discount that to say, well, okay, that's medical school, but this is the real deal, right? This is business. And so your contribution will be a, a, a wonderfully necessary addition to the GME literature. And I, I'm really grateful for your commitment to this. As we end our our time together. Now, Linda, I want to start with you. We end the same way all of our podcasts, which is, you know, you have an audience. What advice would you give to people who are in a, a position of authority or some sort of leadership about disability inclusion based on your experiences? So what I would say is it is absolutely worth it. The amount of learning that I have done throughout this process helps me be a better program director. It helps me train better pediatricians, and it helps me ultimately impact and take better care of many more patients by helping train individuals with disabilities. There were certainly times that were not easy, and there were certainly times that were stressful. But when you are successful, it is absolutely so worth it. I, I again, I feel like I have learned so much and grown so much just by being able to learn from Leanne and how to work with the ACGME and the ABP and work with institutions. And so I think that it is is certainly worth the personal and professional development that happens as a result of that. And you are parlaying all of this into a new leadership role nationally in DIGME, which is disability and graduate medical education, and you are becoming the co-chair. So you're paying it forward in a really big way. And I'm great, grateful to you for that. And the Docs with Disabilities Initiative family is grateful to you for that as well. Leanne? What is your advice to the trainee or to the program or anybody you want to give advice to? You get the last word of, of words. I think for my future pre-medical or medical students, don't be afraid to try. I think what I've learned is that, again, the worst thing I can say is no, Let's say you'll get the interview from the school or the residency program that you were hoping. And because they may be too scared to have a treaty with a disability, well, that probably wasn't the right place for you anyway, because having a medical school, having a residency program that is open to supporting you and wanting to train physicians with disabilities, you'll get a hundred times more out of it than trying to navigate your way up a uphill battle in a program that isn't as interested or isn't as well versed or that isn't open to trying to figure out ways or accommodations, ways to help you become a physician in the end. So I think I learned that along the way as I and um, there were programs that even in their application statement, which I look for, they have the, we do not discriminate against people with disabilities, genders, race. And I was like, great, that is what I want to apply to. And then you don't get the interview there and you're like, oh, well, maybe that wasn't what <laughs> exactly happened. Or maybe I wasn't their best fit for them, which is okay too. So learning that and then being vocal, and I know it's hard to be vocal, but being open and asking questions 
starting conversations, even if you don't know exactly what you need, is okay too. Just taking that leap is the first step. And having help along the way, anyone's always free to reach out to me and to help navigate, help give advice on the journey. Thank you both so much, not only for sharing your story and your experiences with us, but for the work you're doing to to pay it forward. And I, I know I appreciate you and our audience will appreciate this story. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Trong and Dr. Chernsangave, for sharing your wisdom and expertise with us today. We are so grateful for your insight on the accommodation process and residency and your valuable perspectives on the importance of training disabled physicians. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you subscribe to our podcast and tune in next time. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and is supported in part by the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine M Disability Initiative, the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, and the Ford Foundation. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, their respective institutions, or the funders. This podcast is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivative License. This episode was produced by Lisa Meeks, Gabe Abrams, with support from audio editor Jacob Feeman.